The Olympics are going to be here before you know it. There's a lot to talk about, not just USA basketball, but throughout the world. And I have just the journalist to do it. Maggie Hendricks is joining us. Locked on women's basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Locked on Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard Magdal. I want to thank you for making us your first listen every day. We show up for you six days a week. You show up for us, over 180,000 of you last month alone. We are on track to break that here in March. No surprise. Of course, it is not just me. It is our entire team. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast, wherever you get your podcast, YouTube, Spotify, you name it. And make sure you're subscribing to The Next, thenexthoops.com for $9 a month, $72 a year. You get over 100 reported pieces every month on women's basketball delivered straight to your inbox. Make sure you are supporting the work that is being done by this incredible staff across the board. And let me tell you who else does the work. It is Maggie Hendricks, friend to all, cookie master, and journalist extraordinaire covering the 2024 basketball draw and all that comes after it for the Olympics channel. Maggie, when you think about the draw, the way it's come together, the basketball ahead, is there anything more exciting out of all of it? than the fact that Emma Miesemann is going to be on display as a player and, frankly, as a post-game interview. Yes, I'm so excited about Emma, my, our favorite Belgian, um, <laughs> and, and, which, by the way, is is not a short list for me because, you know, but that's Hendrix is a Flemish name. So, you know, but anyway, Emma has been, Emma is so proud to be leading Belgium yeah. And to be helping Belgium grow in basketball, and uh, and I wrote an art article. I wrote a feature on her for Olympics.com, and my discussion with her and when I was in Antwerp was just so cool because we talked. We did talk about the WNBA, and she hasn't shut the door mm -hmm. to come back. But what she said was, you know, my priority has to be building this. And she said, you were at the gym. You understand why. And I was at the gym with 13,700 other people all there, all excited about basketball. And this is six, seven years after they had 50 people at a game. So I get it. And I'm really excited that the Olymp that anybody watching the Olympics is going to get a chance to watch Emma and Belgian basketball. I get it. And and again, so segment one, when we talked about Emma, about the overall uh, draw, we're going to get into USA basketball's path to gold in segment two. In segment three, of course, we're going to be talking about group B, which is very fun and very Minnesota Lynch dominated. But I, I guess, and, and this goes back to just sort of the way I think about it, you know, for Emma, it's about prioritizing the building of women's basketball in her home country and uh, getting a life-changing opportunity to medal at the Olympics. But did anyone talk about our needs? You know, just the fact that here in the United States, we're not getting to see Emma play WNBA basketball. Did that come up at all? Well, I did tell her, I said, I have to ask you these WNBA questions or I will be like pilloried. I have well, to, because as I was watching the games and like tweeting and putting it, putting info out there about the games when I was in Belgium, like that was the main question is when are we going to see Emma back in the WNBA? Yeah. And it just, and, and I made sure to tell her all about that because I'm sure she hears it, but it just is, it's, it is like, it's important that she knows like, Hey, you still have a huge fan base in the United States, particularly in Washington and Chicago. But I mean, it, it like Emma always had a huge contingent of fans every single game I've seen her in. Right. And she's always been wonderful to them too. So that like helps, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's been a huge part of it. I want to lay out the totality of 
the groups and how we're getting from the group of teams playing to who is going to win medals. But I do just want to point out, it's a bit of a side tangent, but I think it's important. The Women's Basketball Hall of Fame taste for Emma Mieseman feels to me like a unique one when you think about it. You know, this is somebody who's obviously doing, has done things in the WNBA to justify it as multi-time all-star and a finals MVP and somebody who has won championships. She's also doing this overseas now. Ultimately, when you think about kind of what leads her case, it's going to be what she's done to build Belgian women's basketball, right? Absolutely. I mean, and that they won Euro League last year, that they they were in their first Tokyo was their first Olympics ever. And yeah. then uh and they took seventh there, and then they took fifth at the World Cup, and then they won Euro League. And like they have just been on this this buildup. And and let's be honest, Emma has made a sacrifice. She could be making a lot of money in the like she would be getting a max contract or at least close to it. If she were playing in the WNBA, she would be getting, uh, you know, sponsorship and all kinds of deals. She would have that open to her. I don't, I, I'm, you know, I'm not concerned about Emma's finance. Like she's, she's, we're not going to have to have a tag sale for her or anything, but (laughs) she's definitely making a sacrifice. And that sacrifice is to build Belgian basketball and it's working. It's worked. And, and like, when you see these little kids wearing the jerseys and just their eyes lighting up when they see her and yelling her name, like it's, it's just an incredible thing. And so I think if Belgium is able to win a medal this year, and I I think they've got a pretty good chance. It's not going to be easy, not winning. It's not easy to win any medal at the Olympics, but I think they have a chance. That would be the thing that would lead her, lead her case. But also she's a, an MVP in Euro league possible she seems like there's a pretty good chance she's gonna be a two-time mvp in the euro league you know i mean there's just there's she just has been able to excel at every level of basketball and even cheryl reeve said she's one of the top five best players in the world i don't think you can argue that point and i think she's proven it in a little bit of a different way and like you said in bifurcated way in her euro league work as well. I'm glad you highlighted it is really significant. Uh, it, it's going to be fascinating to see. But so, all right, let, for those at home who may not know, just going to lay it out here. Group A, Serbia, Spain, People's Republic of China, Puerto Rico. Group B, Canada, Nigeria, Australia, France. Group C, Germany, United States, Japan, Belgium. Take me through. How does it work and who advances? What is the structure of this? So we all have a sense of where it's going and how. So the top two of each group automatically uh, go on, and then they look. They take the top, the third of each one, and the top two of those third places move on. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so there will be eight, and then it's just a regular eight eight team tournament. Is seeding is based on uh, record? Is it? Are there tiebreakers? How does that work? No, I think it's it's already set up based on like Group B first place will pay face Group C second place that thing. Understood. Okay, so again, you know, to assume that the United States will run roughshod over uh, the entire tournament ignores the growth that we've talked about already in Belgium and really throughout. But just even handicapping it here specifically. You're in that group C, United States is the heavy favorite, Germany and Japan, who's giving Belgium the most difficult time, whether it's earning that second guaranteed spot or potentially one of those two, you know, effectively wild card spots, if we want to use the American term. So Japan, I mean, the US played Japan in the silver medal in the gold medal game and Japan won the silver medal in Tokyo. So like that should not be overlooked. They've got a very good team. They play they're really fun to watch play. I really hope uh, American fans get a chance to watch as much of Japan playing as you can because it's just a, it's a, a fun and fast and moving uh, kind of, of play. And Belgium is a very physical game. It has a very good physical game with a good outside shot. Mm-hmm. They have lots of play, players who can shoot from the outside. We know a couple of them, Julie Van Leeuwen, Julie Aleman. Um you know, you'll get to see, and like Julie Van Lu is playing, is going to be playing for the Mystics. So you'll get to know her better 
which you're going to be all excited about, Mitch Dix fans. You're going to love her. Um, but I and think – Josh to go around there too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Japan uh, Japan is, is a really tough team. So, honestly, I kind of feel bad for Germany. This is Germany's first time in the Olympics for women's basketball. Uh, they're a great team. Obviously, we know Satu and Niara Sabali. There's a lot of players that we like on this German team, but they got a rough draw by being in with the U.S. with the gold and silver medalists from Tokyo and the reigning EuroLeague champions. Like, that's that's a tough draw, Germany. Sorry. And and Satu on top of it coming back from shoulder surgery. It's going to be interesting to see what her availability is are there only there are only two Sabalis, unfortunately, which is you know maybe Germany if Germ if if German engineering could come up with a few more ahead of the summer maybe that matters so we'll we'll talk more about that about how to clone players and uh, and and I guess we talked about the players who weren't yet cloned uh, in segment two on USA basketball coming up but first I want to talk to you guys about Prize Picks one of today's sponsors and Prize Picks is doing something called demon time. Don't be afraid. It's okay. It's demon time is a good thing. You can win up to a hundred times your money with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into a thousand dollars. So you look for the red demons or the green goblins in the squares who are marked with them. That gives you the opportunity if you pick right to win up to a hundred times your money. Prize pitch is always easy, right? It's you against the projections. You're not playing against any card sharks or anyone who's looking for that hidden advantage. It's you. It's the money. You figure out how to do it. And also, you can play with the same groups as people like rapper Meek Mill, comedian Andrew Schultz. Just go to the community plays tab to do it, right? How? prizepitch.com slash locked on NBA. And I want you to use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match of up to a hundred dollars. Again, that is prizepitch.com slash locked on NBA and use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match of up to a hundred dollars. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Back here with the great Maggie Hendricks talking about Olympic basketball and what's coming up. Worth noting, of course, we're going to get to see USA basketball in person next week. Uh, I, I will see them at Cleveland uh, during the Final Four. You have the opportunity to see them as well during the All-Star game against the WNBA. Uh, WNBA recently announced Team WNBA, Team USA basketball going up against each other that weekend. As you think through USA basketball getting ready for this, how helpful do you think those types of tests are in getting them ready for Paris? Oh, I mean, that one is huge. And it, if we remember in 2021, that was a really good game between Team USA and Enrique Ogamawale went off. Mm -hmm. So, like, I, I think it's a really helpful thing because a lot of times – the people who are on the WNBA All Stars are pretty pissed off that they didn't get to, they didn't make Team USA, and uh, that just is a good, healthy way to get out that being pissed off. So, uh, I think it's it's a smart thing, and I I'm glad that USA Basketball and the WNBA has continued to work together on this because it makes just for more fun. It's going to be fun for everybody, for the basket, for both teams, for the fans. Fans are going to get to see a real game, you know? Not that there won't be, you know, are some you suggest, Are you suggesting that the all-star game is somehow not a real game, that people may not play defense the way they ought to in the WNBA All-Star game. Are you making that suggestion? Oh, no. How dare I? But, oh you know, I mean, look, All-Star games are super fun. Fans in Phoenix, if you're thinking, maybe I'll get to – no, go. Go to it. It's so much fun. But also, like, the fact that there is a very real game coming up in the future for, the, for Team USA, like, they have to take this seriously, too, to make – as they're – the biggest thing for Team USA is not the talent or the ability or the even like being ready to play. It's knowing the other people that are on the court with them because they don't get to play together that much. So like that is also what that, that game is for is so 
that these players know who they're, you know, like they get to know each other better. So they have to take it seriously. And then the WNBA all-stars are pissed. So they take it seriously. It's just a win all around. And you do talk about it. And, and it's so interesting. There are questions left to be answered about this team, about who's going to be healthy, frankly, who's going to be on that final roster. And I'm guessing you have some at the top of your head. What are the biggest things in your mind that remain unresolved about what USA basketball is going to be doing between now and when we get to opening ceremonies in Paris? I think the biggest thing about like selecting this team is that they have to be careful. Like, let's be honest, they could take just the 12 best players and be and be there and, and probably win a gold medal. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is that good at basketball. However, they also need to make sure that they are building for the future. And so you take a player like Nafisa Collier. She was a baby in the last Olympics. She, that was her first Olympics. She was just learning from everybody. Now, this Olympics, they're definitely expecting her to be a leader. Mm -hmm. If she hadn't have gone to Tokyo, then maybe she wouldn't be the star, like who we have now. We And she wouldn't be as comfortable in that role. So they also have to think about like how they are preparing for LA and beyond when they are making this. Like who are the players? Yes, you want players with experience, but say a player like Ryan Howard or Leah Boston, mm -hmm. Not that their play doesn't qualify them to go. Of course it does. But also making sure that they get chances to understand the international game so that in four years from now, they're more comfortable shepherding Juju Watkins or Caitlin Clark or whoever else is coming along up, up the, the plate. When you look at this team from a long-term perspective, I know there's a lot of conversation about what these young stars will mean for everything from the NCAA to the WNBA, but it's it, in soccer. And you know, this there's been this closing gap because other countries have invested in the sport and U S women's national team is not a given, uh, as we found out quite frankly, uh, in the world cup just last summer, it has been a given that USA basketball is going to win in women's basketball now for is it, it it's seven consecutive olympics right that will be yes the the last time they didn't win was 92 in barcelona the idea that there hasn't been a parade for usa basketball boggles my mind uh having covered multiple parades for the women's soccer team it, there ought to have been already i hope there will be one in 2024 because this is a team and a legacy that deserves to be honored in that way now that said do you think the gap is getting smaller, bigger, or remaining the same, given what we're seeing internationally? But again, a local homegrown set of talent that includes Suju Watkins, that includes Merchantville, New Jersey's own Hannah Hidalgo, it includes players across the board who are coming in and fully supporting not just NCAA and the WNBA, but our USA basketball talent measure as well. So I don't want to compare it to USA soccer or even like men's USA basketball or anything, just because I don't know enough about it. I'm not. But I will say when I'm around the USA women's basketball team, one of the main things they talk about, and this was especially Diana Taurasi was talking about this, but I heard some sort of this phrase of from every single player that they are caretakers of a legacy. They were told by the women who came before them, we won gold for you. Now you need to win it for the next the next people coming up. And they take that really, really seriously. This isn't, this is is not like, oh, we get to go take a trip to France and we'll win a gold. That's not how they look at it. They look, they are very serious about continuing the streak, continuing the legacy because of the women who came before them and the women who came after them. And they are all like everybody is on the same page. And you know, it's funny. I, I know a lot of people have have opinions on Diana Taurasi. I get it. She is a polarizing player for many reasons. It's what happens when you've been around for 20 years, right? Okay. People are going to make opinions on you. But I think that's something that's really important about why we will likely see Diana on break records uh, this year for the Olympics is because she does a better job teaching the players coming behind her about that legacy then I've I've seen anybody do. And even like in Belgium, 
she took all the guards through, you know, it wasn't even just guards. It was just whoever wanted to warm up with Diana. They all did exactly. And it was players from Kelsey Plum, Talia Copper. There were older players. There were younger players. There was everybody was warming up with Diana and having her lead it. And I think players understand that it's not easy to stick around for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And there's something you can learn from her. But it's not just the stuff on the court that they're learning from her. They're also learning about leadership and making sure that we are taking care of what has been entrusted to us. It's also easy to consider her a given, but it's worth remembering she is very young. She was only in her early 40s. And to your earlier point about getting her ready for 2028, that's obviously a critical <laughs> part of this as well. So <laughs> interesting to see whether she's up to the challenge of playing uh, well into the time that she also received Social Security. So back to talk more about Group B in just a moment with segment three. Uh, a lot more to get to, but first, this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. And look, there are always going to be things that are upsetting you, that you have to get off your chest. Maybe you're a high profile early entrant into the WNBA draft and you're upset with an official's call and you have something to say about that official, or maybe you're looking for a different way to process those feelings of anger. Well, BetterHelp gives you the opportunity to do that through therapy. BetterHelp gives you the chance entirely online, designed to be flexible so you can build it around whatever games and practices you have in March Madness that is suited to your schedule. Or you visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA and you get 10% off your first month. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on NBA. Go there today. Give yourself a chance to process your feelings. Make sure you don't get a technical foul. <laughs> We're back with the great Maggie Hendricks talking about Group B. And so I know we talked about it up top, but just to remind everybody, Group B is Canada, Nigeria, Australia, and France. There's not a team in that group that isn't must see. When we talked about Nigeria last time we had you on the show, the fighting Bridget Carltons are incredibly exciting to watch. Australia, of course, coached by Sandy Brondello, fascinating as well. And France, it's the flip side of, you know, kind of the bookends of what we talked about with Emma Mieseman. Marine Johannes is focused on France over the WNBA instead of having her over the head passes going to, let's say, Brianna Stewart's going to go to uh, her teammates uh, on the French national team as well. So kind of take me through how you're thinking about this group B. And I, I don't even know who the favorite is there. Who's the favorite? I think Australia is the favorite by a nose. Like, you right. know, if Australia doesn't play well, uh, I, though I don't see that happening because they're a Sandy Brandello coach team and I don't see them not playing well. Mm -hmm. um, we we both know very well what Sandy can do. Um so, I mean, we know she's one heck of a coach. Speaking of heck of a, heck of a coaches, I want to make sure we give Rena Wakama from Nigeria her flowers. She's an assistant coach in the NCAA. I, I cannot think of a busier human being right now than Rena Wakama, but um, she is a really outstanding coach who really, her players, players like Amy Akonkwo, really, really respect and want and are on the same page with you know you know when you're in an interview and you can you first heard a coach say something and then you hear one player say it and then you hear another player say it and you're like you guys are on the same page i can feel that you know i always tell that to our writers at the next when you can hear the language echoing each other that's how you know a team is together and vice versa by the way yeah. Yeah. I've covered I've covered managers in Major League Baseball where they say something, the player says, "Oh, I never heard that," and almost without fail, that manager is out the door by the end of the season. Seriously, it absolutely is true. Um, so I like and there's a lot to like about this Nigeria team. Mm -hmm. um, Canada, man, they're fun. There's so many players we just like. Obviously, the fight in Bridget Carlton's. Yeah, we also got Kayla McBride. Uh, not Kayla McBride. Sorry, Kayla. Uh, Kayla. Why am I blanking? 
on the Kayla that is also a writer. Dang it, Maggie. Oh, Kayla Alexander. Kayla Alexander. Oh my gosh. Oh. Forgive me now. Not just I'm a writer, sorry. a writer, a fashion model. She's an entrepreneur. She's an artist. She's, She's a Renaissance a- woman. She's Kayla amazing. Kayla Alexander on this program. Shout out. Yeah. Yeah. So like there's there's a lot that's fun about the Canada team and and uh I mean and they had to fight hard to that that uh Olympic qualifying tournament in Hungary was a nail biter for absolutely everybody. Yeah. By the way, including Cheryl Reeve, because she had because she had a team, she had a player on Australia or Hungary and Canada, and only one could get in. So I kind of mm-hmm. kind of felt bad in that moment. But um sorry, Dorka. And then France, you know, U.S. Uh, basketball fans are going to know France well with Gabby Williams and uh, Maureen Johannes leading the way. I'm just, oh, my God, those passes. Oh, they're going to be so good. I mean, just the, the connectivity there is going to be fantastic. And so you're right. There are Cheryl Reeve players throughout Group B. Do you yes. think that she is hoping that somebody else medals or you still think probably her allegiance is to the United States? I think, you know, with being the coach of the United States, she probably still wants the U.S. to win gold. I asked her once, like, how do you compartmentalize? And she said she looks down as a quarter zip she's wearing, and then she knows that's who she's cheering for. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to do it. I never even thought about that. I'm going to have yeah. to accept that. Well, so bottom line between now and Paris where, how can people follow the incredible work that you are doing? Make sure everybody knows it. So I am on Twitter and threads and blue sky. Uh, and I, I share my work in all of those places, just at Maggie Hendricks, all of them. Um, and the, it'll all be on olympics.com. And I will of course be writing about a lot about basketball, but like I did a rugby feature and a discus throwing feature too recently. So you know, it's it's going to be, it's a, a cornucopia of sports for me. I hope you are following Maggie on anywhere you can. It's at M-A-G-G-I-E-H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S for those who are just listening instead of watching. Um, I know, I understand there's an inherent bias in here because I love Maggie very much as a person, but Maggie is such a good journalist. Make sure you are following all that she does. So thank you to our listeners for making us your first listen every day. We will be back tomorrow with Vic Schaefer, head coach at Texas, the number one seed on their way into the Sweet 16. Of course, we will be with you all week. We will have shorts for you, live from practices, behind the scenes access, which you can only get by subscribing to Lockdown Women's Basketball and over at thenexthoops.com. Until then, I am Howard Magdal wishing all of you a wonderful Tuesday. Ogumba Wallet for the win! You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball.